The idea being, again, you, you probably sort of read about this to do the mastering chemistry, but when you collect gas, if you collect it over water, meaning that you bubble it through water and then figure out how much gas you have, that gas that you're collecting is not only the gas that you're making. Like in this example, zinc is reacting with HCl to produce hydrogen gas, and it's filling up this beaker. But there's not just hydrogen gas there, because there's hydrogen. Because there's always some water vapor, some vapor pressure, which is the amount of vapor produced by, by a liquid. So to do problems like this, we have to account for the vapor pressure of water as a part of the partial pressure in that system. And to do so, you need a table like this. And you would always be given these. You wouldn't have to memorize these numbers. Yeah, yeah, no, you don't have to memorize this. This is something you would, have, you would look up or be given or whatever. And it tells you that based on what the temperature is, what is the vapor pressure of water? That in, the va in, in this case, when we say vapor pressure, we mean what is the partial pressure of water in the vapor above this, um, or in this container? So to use that, it's actually, I mean, it sounds a little complicated, but it's, it's really just a subtraction. So a problem where you might use this is something like this. You do this reaction, decompose this uh, potassium chlorate, and produce oxygen. And here's the key phrase that you want to look for in these problems. Collected over water, collected by displacement of water, something about that this thing happened over water. When you see that, and specifically the water part, you know that this vapor now is made up of two components, the gas that you're collecting and the water vapor. So using the idea that the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures, we just have to subtract out the water pressure and then do the rest of the problem like normal. So the only difference when you're collecting over water is you have to subtract out the water pressure from your total pressure before you go on and do the rest of the uh, stuff. Um, so for instance, the question asked says that this thing was collected at 22 degrees C at a total pressure of 254 torr. Um, so what, what that means is the total pressure in that container is, two, is seven, sorry, 754 torr. To get the pressure of just the oxygen, you have to subtract the pressure of the water. And the pressure of the water is given as 21 torr. So to, um, we say that the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures, in this case the pressure of oxygen and the pressure of water. So that total pressure, 754 torr, is the partial pressure of oxygen, which is what we need to know to fi finish the problem, plus the partial pressure of water, which is given as 21 torr. And if it's not given right in the problem, you can look it up on a table like the one above. So this tells us then that the partial pressure of oxygen is 733 torr. And I'll do the first conversion for you, and then I'll ask you to continue. So this is 0.964 atmospheres. All right, so see if you can now, as a little bit of review from last week, finish this problem. Now that we know the pressure of oxygen, we know the temperature, 22 degrees C, and we know the volume, 0 0.650 liters, figure out the mass of potassium chlorate in the sample that was decomposed based on all that information. So you'll use a gas law, figure out moles of oxygen to get moles of potassium chlorate, and so on. So look good. Most of you um, figured out that you need to find moles using the ideal gas law, right? So that's going to be now your pressure, your volume, R, and T, 22 degrees C 
is 295k. Okay, so we do all that, and we should get 0 0.026. Moles of oxygen. We good? Okay. So at this point, this problem is no longer no longer has anything to do with gases anymore. Once you found this, this is just a plain old stoichiometry problem from the last chapter. Uh, so you've got 0.26 moles of oxygen. How many moles of potassium chlorate is that then? Or how do you find that? Two thirds, right? So you go point if you want to write it all out. You've got two moles of potassium chlorate for every three moles of oxygen based on the equation. And then we can multiply that by the molar mass of potassium chlorate. One twenty three grams. Something like that. Obviously, we were a little not quite right with significant figures, but but we're close. That look good. All right. Okay, so that essentially takes care of, of all of the calculations, minus a couple small ones um, that we'll talk about in a minute. And what you should be able to do is use the ideal gas law to do these calculations. Uh, use partial pressures and mole fractions to, as necessary. Um, collect gas over water. All of these are pretty standard type questions. There's not a lot of variations you can have here. Either you're given the volume or you're given the pressure or you're given moles or something. You have to find something else. It's essentially variations on the same thing. So if you do all the problems, you're not gonna you're not gonna see anything new um, on the exam. So so that's that's a good thing I think. There's no no, no fancy surprises here, um, but you do have to know how to do these types of things. So make sure that you go through and do these homework problems, um, not just on online but the ones in the book as well. And make sure that also that you're while you're doing these, you're reviewing the stoichiometry limiting reactant stuff from chapter four, because this all kind of goes together. OK. So now moving on. The next part of this chapter is kind of a way of describing what is actually going on in a sample of a gas. So we talked about the difference between a theory and a law, right? At the, the beginning? Anybody remember that? What's the difference between a theory and a law? Okay, so everyone forgot. Good. Um, <laughs> no, that's it's, that's important because it's it's like a broad, broadly societal, broad societal um, misconception is that a theory is like something you're still trying out until it becomes a law and then it becomes fact. Because the other way we use law is like government law, right? And once something becomes a law, then it's like a thing. But that's not the case with scientific laws. Laws describe a, series, a set of observations, and theories describe reasons behind those observations, or reasons behind why things are happening. They're both subject to evidence, they're both subject to change, and they can both have various degrees of certainty or uncertainty involved in them. Um, examples are things like a th atomic theory. We talked about the atomic theory. That's a theory because it describes why matter behaves in the way it does. It behaves that way because it's made up of atoms, and then there are all these consequences to the fact that it's made up of atoms. Now, does that mean that the atomic theory is subject to debate and not very well accepted? No, we accept atomic theory because we can see atoms right now, and, and it works for everything. Um, so theories can be just as ironclad as laws, although anything in science is subject to some amount of uncertainty as new um, evidence is found. But the kinetic molecular theory then is an explanation as to why gases behave the way they do. 
So think about the laws of gases that we talked about. Boyle's law. Boyle's law is, you remember that? What is Boyle's law? Pressure and volume. Pressure and volume. I don't think that's quite descriptive enough. What about pressure and volume? Yeah, pressure times volume is always constant. So an increase in pressure leads to a decrease in volume. Increase in volume leads to a decrease in pressure when there's constant temperature. That's a law because it's a set of observations. You can get a bunch of gases together, you will have for a long time, and you keep finding this over and over again. But notice what it doesn't say. It says nothing about why that is. Why should volume decrease when pressure increases? Why should pressure increase when volume decreases? Boyle's Law doesn't try to tell you that. Boyle's Law just says it does, right? So the kinetic molecular, th molecular theory is, supposed to, is the other side of that. This is saying, why does this happen? So we assume a couple things about gases, and then we use those assumptions to explain all of these different laws and observations that we talked about in the first part of the chapter. So first, we'll talk about some of the assumptions. Um, and, and before we even kind of go through this, I just want to show you the picture, because I don't think I put it in here. Yeah. Let me show you the picture. I think this kind of almost describes it better than all the words, although the words are, of course, more specific. Here's a picture from your book, right? It's a beaker or a flask full of gas. And here, this is essentially what the kinetic molecular theory says. It says gas particles are traveling in straight lines. They are hitting each other in elastic collisions, which means when they hit, they, um, don't, they don't change the amount of energy that they have. Uh, it says that the spaces between the gas particles is much more important than the, particle, than the size of the particles themselves. So essentially, gas particles um, don't take up space. And because of that, we can uh, explain a lot of these things. So the other part of this are these pictures of these balls that are over on the edges hitting the wall. The other part of, of this uh, kinetic molecular theory is that particles, or I'm sorry, pressure comes from collisions. So the more times a gas particle hits a, in a, the edge of a container, the higher the pressure. In other words, the thing that's causing the pressure is all of the gas particles hitting the sides. And the more they hit the sides, the greater that pressure becomes. All right? Assuming that's what's happening, we can explain a couple of things. Oh, the other part of that, the average kinetic energy of a collection of gas particles is assumed to be directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. The kinetic energy being the energy of motion of these particles, which is essentially proportional to the velocity, right? Um, physics folks, part of the square of the velocity. Kinetic energy is approximately 1 half mv squared, if you've done that sort of physics. So um, m is mass and v is velocity. So the kinetic energy is proportional to the mass and to the square of the velocity, which means faster moving particles have higher kinetic energy and are therefore hotter because the temperature is proportional to that kinetic energy. So essentially we're saying the temperature in Kelvin is proportional. This is a symbol for is proportional to that same quantity. Are you going to have Yes. What? <laughs> I don't even mean for this class. That's like something you should know for life. Oh, no, I'm not for this. Like all of those things? Like, no, like that. Why would you need to know this for life? Like, what am I going to calculate kinetic energy? You need to know that energy, the kinetic energy is proportional to the square of velocity or, or to mass. All right. And we'll get into this later when you actually, why you actually need to calculate it in this class. But yes. <laughs> Physics is life. You can't understand your life without at least a basic knowledge of physics. OK, so here are your assumptions. The particles are small, so they don't, the size doesn't really matter. The kinetic energy is, is proportional to the uh, temperature. So based on the mass and velocity, we can say something about the temperature. The particles don't exert forces on each other, because they're so far apart. 
um, and they're in constant motion. Now, these assumptions start to break down when we get to some certain extremes of um, conditions, and we'll talk about that. But in most cases, they predict behavior well. So now let's talk about how this theory can be applied to the laws and make sense of them. So for Boyle's law, we saw that when, when moles and temperature are constant, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. What we would say in kinetic molecular theory, or why that explains it, is that a decrease in volume leads to more collisions, because now you have the same amount of particles taking up less space. So they're if you imagine a big barrel with a bunch of balls or something flying around hitting the sides, and you suddenly make that a, a lot smaller, they're going to hit the sides a lot more often. right? You've got the same amount of things, and they have the same amount of energy. So that is the pressure. Remember, the collisions are the pressure. So if you decrease that volume, you increase the collisions, you now have more pressure. All right? So that's how we use that molecular theory, the kinetic molecular theory, to explain the observation. Let's try another one. Pressure and temperature, which is, um, those are directly proportional, right? You increase pressure, you increase temperature. So if we increase the um, temperature, we're essentially saying that the kinetic energy is increasing, which is another way of saying the particles are moving faster. So if the particles are moving faster, they're going to hit the wall a lot more often, right? And if they hit the wall a lot more often, there's your increase in pressure. Right? Okay. So that's the idea. So now you try one. Think about this one, Charles' law. Volume is proportional to temperature when the uh, N, R, and P are constant. So if volume decreases, then temperature decreases. How does the molecular theory explain that? So don't shout it out. Think about it, because this stuff is, is a little tricky to get your mind around. So think about it a bit, and then talk to just one person next to you. Or if it doesn't work out with numbers, maybe two people. But try to just like have a good conversation with one person after you've thought about it. And why do you think that explanation works? And then, and then I'll, ask you, I'll ask a couple people to share what, what you came up with. Anybody else have something different to add to that? Did you hear that or come off of that? That's, that's right. That's the idea. So if, if the volume decreases, you now have a smaller container. And therefore, if the pressure stays constant, that means that the number of collisions must stay the same as they were in the big container. So big container, small container, the collisions all have to be the same. So the kinetic energy or the speed of the molecules must decrease. Because if the kinetic energy stayed the same, there would be way more collisions in the smaller box. But since the pressure has to stay the same and keep the same amount of collisions, the temperature has to go down. So you have to slow down those particles so that they don't hit the walls as much. And that gives you your, um, your decrease in temperature if you slow down those particles. OK? Try this one. Volume in moles. If the number of moles increases, of the Zavagadra's law, right? The volume must increase. Yeah. Can you just make a note of that? So we have it in the notes. Um, or can you just repeat it? Yeah. It, they describe it in sentences in the book, but I, I'm not sure. I'm just I would, but I'm not sure how to write it succinctly. Let's try. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Let's 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 draw a picture of it. Maybe that'll help. So you got a big container goes to a small container, right? All right. You got these particles flying around in the big container, hitting the walls, right? And the amount they hit the walls tells you the pressure. Since the pressure is constant, and the, and the N is constant, so you have the same number of particles, they have to hit the walls the same amount of time, the same amount of wall hitting. So. In order to have the same amount of wall hitting in a smaller space, the particles have to slow down. And if they're slowed down, that's another way of saying the temperature has decreased. Because the temperature is proportional to that motion. Okay. 
So think about that the same way now in this next one. Volume of number of moles. If we increase the number of moles and keep the other stuff constant, then the volume must increase. Why? That's right. That's right. So if the pressure is the same, we need more space for those extra moles to go around. Otherwise, they're going to hit the walls more and there's going to be more pressure. So it's kind of the opposite picture here. You have a small thing. Wait. Yeah. With, let's say, three particles flying around. If we suddenly put, add three more particles, we need more space so they don't have more collisions. So we need a bigger place for all of them to go so that they're still you know, hitting the walls at the same rate and with the same speed. No. No, that's right, because it depends on what you're holding constant. So when one changes, these, these individual laws tell us how things change based on looking at like two properties, like pressure and volume, or volume and moles. You have to keep the other ones constant, otherwise you have too many forces all kind of coming at the, or too many factors all going on at the same time. You can't really show that. Yeah. OK, and mixtures. That makes sense. So I don't, I'm not going to go through this whole derivation. I'm not sure it's really important. Um, the book goes through it. I'm just going to kind of give you the results, if that's OK. The goal of this thing is using basic particle physics, like kinetic energy, you can actually derive the ideal gas law based on uh, descriptions of the um, gases. Now. Um, I think that's interesting. It's certainly instructive, and it's fairly amazing if you kind of go through it and see how this ideal gas law emerges from some basic physics. But I'm not sure it's useful in this class to spend the time to really go through it. Um, I found in the past people mostly just get confused. So here are the things that you need to know from that. Here are the essential um, results of going through and doing this derivation. We have something called the root mean square velocity which is a way of describing the motion of particles rather than looking at the individual mass of the particle and the velocity of the particle or, and the kinetic energy of the particle, which gives you the, um, which you could get the, sorry, the regular velocity from, from this. That's not super useful because the particles are really small. The velocity of any individual particle and it's hard to find the kinetic energy of a single particle. So what we do instead is we use this thing called root mean square velocity because the root mean square velocity depends on the mass of a mole and the temperature in Kelvin. And those are things that we can measure. So we can say essentially a gas is moving about this fast based on its temperature and its molar mass. That's the point of root mean square velocity. When we talked in those previous problems about the gas's speed increasing or decreasing, Here's how we actually can get a value for that speed. We can look at the actual temperature and the actual molar mass, and we can say, OK, this one's faster than this one. So based on that, would you say that a container full of helium or a container full of neon has a higher pressure, given everything else constant, moles and all that constant? What has the higher pressure, the helium or the neon? Why the helium? Mass. That's right. So you look at this equation and you say, OK, well, it's inversely the speed is inversely proportional to the molar mass. So something with a small molar mass like helium is going to be traveling faster given all the other same conditions as the, um, as the same container of neon, which is going to necessarily be going slower. So we can, we can start, do you see how we can start to use this to explain things for specific gases? We can look at molar mass and temperature, and we can start to get some numbers here. So all right. this is all available, by the way, online. So um, it can be helpful if you 
print this out and bring it in so you don't have to be scribbling it down the whole time. Or you can check it later. Because again, a lot of the stuff I just talk about, it's there for your reference. It's not like I need to read every line for you. So in the most basic way, you can do this kind of a problem. Calculate the root mean square velocity for the atoms in a sample of helium gas at 25 degrees C. Essentially, also, we should note this root mean square thing, this is not just involved with gases. It's a statistical term. It's a type of average. Yeah, it's in sound systems. It's in sound systems for cars, yeah. Right. It, it has to do with the, in any sample of, well, for atoms or for volumes in a sound or in a car, you have a range. It's not just one. It's not like all the atoms are traveling at one speed. There's a range of speeds. And this is a type of average that gives you a sense of how fast everything is. Yeah? Do we have to change that to Kelvin? Yes. So in doing this, you need the mass of the mole in, Kelv in kilograms, and you need the temperature in Kelvin because it involves R. And if you ever are confused about that or you don't know if it should be in kilograms or in Kelvin or in liters or whatever in atmospheres, just look at R. R is always the thing that determines those units for you. Um, and if you, if you have a different R, then you use different units. But, so, so we're going to use a different R right now because we're using joules um, instead of the joules will, will cancel to give us the velocity and not the liter atmosphere per Kelvin mole. How do you know when you use the um, It just depends on what your units, what you want your units to be. Um, so like the reason we use the joule here is because we want a um, velocity in meters per second where the atmosphere wouldn't give us that. So pretty much you can use, you can just use that in this case. The other one works. In this case, you need this one. In the other problems, you can use any R you want. In this case, you could use this, uh, the other R too, but you wouldn't get meters per second. You get something else. I'm not sure what. All right, so you just, this is just a plug in the equation. So you're essentially looking at the square root of 3RT over the molar mass temperature in Kelvin is 298 and the molar mass of helium is 4 Oh, yeah, thank you. Good point. Yes, that's right. That's why I should have written my units here. Because uh, we need kilogram here, because a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So we need to convert this that many kilograms per mole. And so then we end up with, I think I have this one. Thirteen sixty three meters per second. All right. So is that just it's just the moles divided by a thousand, right? Yes, just the moles divided by a thousand, right? Okay. So that number by itself is not terribly useful. Where we'll use this is in comparisons and in the comparisons that we've done. So looking at a sample of one gas versus another, you can make some distinctions about which one is traveling faster based on the temperature and the molar mass. OK. So now let's looking, look at what's actually happening here and what we're doing when we're sort of averaging these, this out. Um, another quantity that we can use is something called the mean free path. The mean free path is the distance a gas travels between collisions. In other words, how, it's sort of a how much space is there, but also taking the speed into account. Something that's going faster is going to have a smaller mean free path because it's going to hit something sooner. Right? Um, and so you can think about how those 
also factor in then to discussions about temperature and volume in moles. So we can look at something that looks like this, some of these, these pictures. And you can see that for different gases, they have various um, different ranges of velocities. So the RMS velocity is not the only thing that changes here. The range actually changes as well because something like hydrogen is going to have a much larger range of molecular velocities at a given temperature than something that then as they get heavier. And this distribution changes with temperature too. As you increase the temperature, you increase the amount of kinetic energy, you also increase the range. So yes, the averages are moving up, but there will still be some particles that are still tra that are traveling very slowly. So you essentially increase the range of velocities increase the average velocity, but you still actually in the sample have that full range of velocities because the gases are really having kind of erratic paths and hitting each other and the particles are all hitting each other. Um, so when you think about velocity increasing or velocity decreasing with molar mass or increasing with temperature, don't just think about a single speed that every molecule has. Think about it as a range. And the range is actually what's increasing. And the averages increase or decrease along with that range. But to say that every single particle of oxygen in a sample of whatever temperature is going this speed is wrong. It's actually a range of temperature. And the smaller the particle, the bigger that range will be. All right. And then a couple little equations um, to kind of also deal with this, we have to look at a couple quantities called diffusion and effusion. Diffusion is gases mixing together, and effusion is gases escaping through a tiny little hole. So you have a pressurized container, you poke a little hole in it, tiny, tiny hole, the gas will escape. What do you think escapes faster, something big or something little? Right. So it's fairly common sense. Um, Graham's law of effusion sounds fancy, but essentially it just says that the rate of effusion is proportional to, inversely proportional to the molar mass. And it actually goes as the square root of the molar mass. That's just an um, observation. So you can look at the rates of two gases. In other words, how fast is this one? How much faster does this one effuse than this one? The smaller one's always going to fuse faster. Right. And so that's really the key here. Let's write that down. Smaller fuses faster. Why is that important? Well, when you're doing these types of problems, it can be easy to get mixed up, put the wrong one on top or on bottom or whatever. You just check the question, see what they're asking for. And as long as you remember that the smaller one always goes faster, which you sort of came up with before I even told you that, because it makes sense. You got a tiny hole, the little things are getting out faster. You should be OK. Um, this is how this sort of thing would be asked. Calculate the ratio of the effusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride, a gas used in the enrichment process to produce fuel for nuclear reactors. So how we do this. m2 to the 1 half over m1 to the 1 half. Or, since these things are distributed, you can, you can divide them first and then do the square roots. But we can look at hydrogen gas, which in this case is 2 divided by uf6, which is what? More than that? 352? And you get that that ratio about 0 0.075. So, whoops, it's the square root of those, yeah. Okay. 
And so we just say, okay, that's the ratio of these. Okay. All right, and that's pretty much it. This last part, don't worry about this stuff too much. It's basically all they can ask you is plug it into this equation. The important stuff is the kinetic molecular theory stuff uh, that we just talked about. So take a look at this picture. I know, I know. Hold on. <laughs> I haven't got it yet. OK, I've got three, three gases here in some containers. Which one do you think would have, um, let's say that, which one, A or B, which one has the higher pressure? A or B. Size, by the way, we're saying is um, essentially molar mass. So the bigger ones are heavier. So which one is higher pressure container, A or B? All right, think about it for a minute. Higher pressure, A or B? All right, who says A? Who says B? All right, some people didn't choose. we got to try it again. Everybody's got to pick one. Who says A? Who says B? All right, A's, why? Somebody. So they're smaller, they move faster. So they're smaller, they'll move faster. All right, B's, why B? Bigger. Well, it, it kind of takes an assumption about the temperature, right? We have to assume something about the temperature here. So essentially, yes, A should have the higher pressure. Because in the kinetic molecular theory, remember, even though the big particles are showing the bigger molar mass, the space between the particles is so much greater that the actual size of the particles themselves doesn't matter. The mass matters because the mass affects the velocity, but the size doesn't. Um, well, I guess that kind of depends. I guess we're assuming that temperature is constant, right? I should have. I wasn't clear about that. If temperature is constant, then the heavier one has to be traveling slower than the lighter one, and then the lighter one has more collisions. So, so in that case, yes, A would be higher pressure because temperature is constant. If temperature is not constant, then yeah, you can't really say because it could be compensating in any way. All right, what about A and C? Assuming again, the same temperature, which one has the higher pressure? C, right, why? Yeah, there's more moles, so there's more particles, so you're getting more collisions. All right. Okay. Just blank pages. Oh. All right, let's talk a little bit about real gases. Um, so up to now, I mean, you can't really see those colors. Up to now, we've seen only ideal gases. We've talked about ideal gases both in a math sense of calculating things about them and in a theoretical sense of the kinetic molecular theory. But of course, actual gases don't behave that way. Actual gases are real, and they deviate a little bit. They don't deviate much. The ideal gas law, as we said, is a good model in most cases. Look at these gases given here. You've got an ideal gas where one, lead, one mole is exactly 22.41 liters at STP. And then you've got some other gases, chlorine, carbon dioxide, ammonia, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen. And you see that the um, volume varies slightly from quite a bit less in something like chlorine to a little bit more in something like hydrogen. But essentially, it's, it's similar. So here are the differences. Um, a scientist called Van der Waals described this, and so we often call these the Van der Waals factors. Uh, he, d he noticed that as the pressure increases, the volume starts to become higher than predicted. So as the pressure increases, you see here the ideal gas is at whatever pressure, or I'm sorry, volume. As the pressure increases, the ideal gas is at some volume. The real gas is at uh, a little bit more volume. All right. So 
So why do you think that is? It's not what? I think so. Yeah, I think you're getting. I think you're in the right track there. Right. As you get, think about what's happening when you're pressurizing this. You're getting the particles closer and closer and closer together. So one big assumption of the kinetic molecular theory is that the space between gases is so much bigger than the size of the actual molecules that the size of the actual molecules don't matter. But as you get those molecules closer and closer and closer together and you pressurize it, suddenly those sizes start to matter. So whether something has um, you know, an atomic radius of one angstrom or three angstroms or something like that starts to actually matter when these things get super close together. And that's the first failure, or not really failure, but deviation from ideality, is that as you pressurize this, the size of the particle starts to become uh, important. And so you have to subtract from the ideal uh, volume this factor nb, which is the number of particles times the volume of the particle. Now, how do you find the volume of a gas particle? We well, have to look it up. So there are these tables of van der Waals factors, A and B, um, and you look it up and, and you plug it in accordingly based on the number of, of, of moles. The other part of this, I'll zoom in on this, the other thing that affects the behavior is at very, very low temperatures, or as the temperature decreases, it doesn't really have to be that low, but as the temperature decreases, the actual pressure becomes lower than the predicted pressure. And this has to do with intermolecular forces. Remember, again, one of the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory is that gas particles don't interact with each other. They don't attract each other. They don't repel each other. They're simply unaffected. That's not actually real in chemistry. We know, we'll talk about this more um, in later chapters, but we know that molecules can attract each other through these things called intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bonding, van der Waals forces, I don't know if you've heard these things before. We'll get into them later. But that's why like, we have liquids, right? Because they actually attract each other, or solids. So as the temperature becomes lower, the attraction of gas particles to each other becomes important. And they actually end up having less pressure because they're attracted to each other. So they're not colliding completely elastically. They're somewhat attracted to each other. And that pressure, um, and that's having an effect on the pressure. So those are the main two things that change the ideal gas law when we talk about real particles, real gases. And here's the correction. So you've got your PVNRT, right? Here's how we're going to correct it. We, we add to the pressure a little bit of this based on the number of particles in the volume and this A. And then we subtract from the volume a little bit of this. All right, And those A's and B's, like I said, are not numbers that you can just come up with. They're experimentally derived, and you can look them up on a table. And you can say, OK, um, helium has uh, whatever numbers. And these numbers aren't, aren't big. Um, let me show you. Um, I don't think so. What is, what's the OBS subscript on the name? Observed pressure. So the observed, pr you're converting the observed pressure to the ideal pressure, okay. um, essentially. Here's that table. Here's what these things look like. So it gives you a sense of which particles will have the biggest changes. One thing that, that's probably good to know is that A is the thing that deals with pressure and B is the thing that deals with volume. So you see the difference in B very much depends on the size of the particle itself. Something like carbon tetrachloride, which is a big molecule, four chlorines around a carbon center, has a big deviation in volume because that size of that particle actually is significant. It also has a significant deviation in A because the forces between those particles um, tend to be, are, are becoming important. So I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to check my old tests. I don't think you need to know that equation, but I don't want to get you in trouble and 
it comes up on the final or something. So I'll have to check on that. Yeah, I figure you will. Do you have to know like when you're adding MBT or MB? Yeah, I I don't want you to have to know it, but I'm concerned that you might. So I don't remember. I'll get back to you on that. But I d you definitely should know the things we just talked about. You should be able to explain why certain gases deviate more than others from ideality based on either the pressure deviation or the volume deviation. So I want you to ex understand that idea and uh, understand these graphs. But to do the actual calculations, I'm not that excited about it. I, I mean, there's... Essentially, there's nothing interesting about this calculation, right? The problem would give you A and B, and you would have to plug in the rest of the numbers and, and punch it in your calculator. I, I don't see that as, as being very important. I'm more concerned as do you understand how these changes change what are our assumptions from the kinetic molecular theory and change what we have to think about. OK, so let's look at actually some problems now. And we'll do this a little bit more upstairs. Remember at the beginning, I asked you about this flat tire question? I said you have a flat tire, but it's not that flat, and you're late or just lazy. So you don't fill it up, you just drive to school. You get to school, you look at your tire, it's filled up. And you think, ah, I don't have to fill it up anyway. Great, the fairies did it. <laughs> or whatever. Um, whatever magical creatures you believe in filled in your tire. So now we know some things about this. And we said initially we were talking about this in terms of one of the laws. And we said, well, it's because there's this inverse relationship, whatever. Well, now we know this kinetic molecular theory. So how do you explain this based now on the kinetic molecular theory? How do you actually describe what's happening, or how do you use what's happening with the molecules inside that tire? to describe this effect at, that you got after driving. OK, it heated up. How does that change that based on kinetic molecular theory? Yeah? Increase, right? OK, yes. And so that's the first part of this. But, but that's an observation, right? Temperature increased, volume increased. That's an observation. So now I'm asking, what's the reason behind that? So what caused that change in volume? <laughs> yeah, so that's the first part of it. So the temperature increased, which means the particles started moving faster. We're assuming here that no actual extra air did get in your tire, which is probably a good assumption, right? So you have the same amount of moles of gas inside there, same amount of particles. The temperature increased, so they started going faster. So how does that affect the volume? Yeah. They're hitting the outside faster. So the or they're hitting, goes up. There are more collisions, so the pressure goes up. And because rubber isn't a fixed wall, it can expand to accommodate that extra pressure and end up with an increase in volume. All right? So if this were a hard walled system, say your, your wheels were not rubber, but they were um, metal or glass or something. I don't know why they'd be flat in the first place. This is turning into a really bad example. but. If you drove and those things heated up, you would not expand it. You would just, it would just get more higher pressure. But when you're in an elastic walled system like a tire, then it can expand to accommodate that extra pressure. You wouldn't do it far. What? You wouldn't be out of class. No, no, no. I, that's what I said. This is going to be a pretty bad example. Um, but that's the idea. Probably. Yeah. There'd be all kinds of problems. OK. So let's let's look at some of these uh, some of these problems now. I'm trying to find a. Most of the book problems are focusing on. Here we go. Exactly equal amounts in moles of gas A and B are combined in a one liter container at room temperature. Gas B has a molar mass twice that of gas A. Which statement is true for the mixture of gases and why? So is A true? The molecules of gas B 
have greater kinetic energy than those of gas A. Just, let's just think of A. Let's think of the first one right now. The molecules of gas B have greater kinetic energy than those of gas A. True or false, given the conditions listed? True. Let everybody get a chance. We'll, we'll see. So everybody, everybody think about it. It's essentially a true-false question, right? So commit to an answer. Try not to guess. Try to have a reason behind what you say. Who thinks that that is true? Gas B has a greater kinetic energy than gas A. Okay. Who thinks that's false? All right, and a lot of a lot of no guesses here. <laughs> All right. Let's look at this. Those of you who were fairly certain about it, who wants to give a reason for why you said true or false? Go ahead. Or, yeah. Because the equation. Which equation? Okay, so kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. B has a greater mass, so therefore B has a greater kinetic energy. So, well, that's if the velocity is constant. Right. So, is the velocity constant? It could be. Do we know? No, we don't know. We sort of do, actually. I think we're entering the realm of randomly guessing now, so maybe we should, maybe we should say that. There's a key phrase here that gives you the answer. And by the way, I'm just going to tell you, this, this, this part A is like the most missed thing in this whole business. Whenever I ask something like this, people always miss it. Um, here's the key to it, and I'll tell you. What does that mean, that gas A and gas B are at room temperature? They're at the same temperature. And how is temperature related to kinetic energy? Right, so if two samples are at the same temperature, they must have the same kinetic energy, regardless of, other, of anything else. Okay. If they didn't have the same kinetic energy, they wouldn't have the same temperature. So these have to be the same. This is false. All right. Now, your equation was right. Kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mass times velocity squared, and the mass of B is bigger. But then the velocity must be smaller because the fact that they're at the same temperature tells us that they must have the same kinetic energy. Okay. What about B? Gas B has a greater partial pressure than gas A. Why false? Well, we don't know. Well, how does molar mass uh, relate to pressure? Yeah? We have bigger pressure when we have uh, smaller molar mass. Right. 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 Okay. So this is. C is true. What about C? The molecules of gas B have a greater average velocity than those of gas A. False. 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 Also false, right? This is essentially the same question. This is a similar question to A. The kinetic energy is the same, right? The one with the bigger velocity is going to be the one with the smaller mass, because the mass and velocity have to offset if you're going to have the same kinetic energy. So gas A would have the, the greater average velocity. And what about D? Gas B makes a greater contribution to the average density of the mixture than gas A. That's true. And do you do that by process of elimination, or do you actually have a reason behind it? That's right. Remember that we talked about how um, mass divided by volume is, is uh, density, and then we can combine that with the moles in the um, ideal gas law to talk about the density of the gas based on the molar mass. So yes, the thing with the greater molar mass is going to contribute more to the density, and that is gas B. Okay. So I could have asked this on a quiz or exam. And you would have said, oh, great, true or false questions. And then you would have gotten like 
most, most of them wrong, right? So that's really the key with these, especially when it comes to multiple choice questions. Make sure you're thinking these through correctly. Make sure that you have that right uh, mental framework to think about what's happening in each of these cases. Let's try another one. No. No? Can we do like the math? We'll get back to the math. We got a whole hour for math upstairs. Uh, almost. That's that's actually chapter eight, I think. Oh. But yeah, we'll get there soon. All right, this one. Which gas would you expect to deviate most from ideal behavior under low temperature conditions? Fluorine, chlorine, or bromine? So first step, because we just talked about this. First step, low temperature. Think about, give you, get yourself a picture of what's happening at low temperature and why it's important. So what happens at low temperature? If you, if you imagine a sample of gas, you have very, very low temperatures. What's happening to those gas molecules? Slow increases. Slow. Yes, they're getting very slow, right? So they're just... So how, how do they deviate from ideal behavior when they're moving very slowly? They're slower than Well, yes, all of that stuff, yeah, all of that is true. Um, specifically, let's look back at this graph. So these are a couple sh shapes to keep, whoops, we missed it. So at very low temperature, right, they start to interact with each, with each other more because they don't have the speed to just get away from each other. You can think about it that way. So they're starting to interact with each other more. Have more attractions. And so which one of those do you expect to deviate most? Probably the bromine, because it's the biggest, so it's going to have the most area for the molecules to interact with each other. In low temperature, the bigger things can interact with each other more than littler things. So here's the key to this one. The explanation. Here's where you could go wrong. Because I think you guys, I think everybody kind of got this right, chose the big, the, the bigger, the bigger molecule is almost always right. Whenever something is, which one is more deviation from ideal, bigger is always more deviation from ideal. But it's the explanation that might get you. If you said, well, it, it deviates most from ideal behavior at low temperature, because it's big and it takes up space and that changes the volume, that's not quite right. Because the, the changing the volume thing um, is more an issue of pressure, of high pressure, than low temperature. At low temperature, it's the intermolecular forces that are important. So yes, you'd probably get this right because the bigger one is always the most deviant. But you have to be clear that it's because of the intermolecular forces, because of the atoms interacting with each other, that this is happening. Okay, whoops. All right, we'll do a nice math one for you guys now, just for fun. Where's a good one? Oh my god, those are so long. Can I do the long ones? We'll do long ones upstairs. Yeah, 129. We haven't done a lot of these whole fraction type ones yet. When 0.583 grams of neon is added to an 800 cubic centimeter bulb containing a sample of argon, the total pressure of the gases is found to be 1.17 atmospheres at a temperature of 295K. Find the mass of the argon in the bulb. So now you have two different gases mixing together, which means we're going to have to deal with partial pressures, right? OK. So how would, you, how would you do this? What equation? Yes, there's going to be some equation here, I would assume. Yeah. 
Right, so we're def we definitely want to know moles. So 0.53 grams of neon is how many, how many moles? Or 583. No. No, it's not a diatomic gas. Okay. So now can we find the partial pressure of neon? We can, right? Because we know the ideal gas law. We got pressure. We've got or we don't we don't know pressure, we want pressure. We've got moles, we got temperature, we got volume. So we can now find that the partial pressure of neon right? our moles we just calculated. Our R, our temperature, 295K, and our um, volume, which is 800 cubic centimeters, which we should convert to liters. So what is that in liters? No, 0.8. A, centimeter, a cubic centimeter is a milliliter. So our partial pressure of neon is then, somebody want to punch that out? Point what? Point eight seven five? Okay, so our partial pressure of neon is 0.875. How do we continue now? Because we want to know the mass of argon. Subtract. We use the partial pressure of argon. Okay, right. So we first need to find the partial pressure of argon by realizing that the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures. We know the total pressure is 1.17 atmospheres, and we know the neon partial pressure because we just found it. So now we can find that the partial pressure of argon is the total minus partial of neon, which is what? Zero point two. All right. Now what? Just plug it in. So the moles of argon is going to be the partial pressure of argon times the volume over RT, which is 978 Is that right? No, oh, this would be 0.010. Right. How many times do we three significant figures, but point zero zero what? 975. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we got that many moles of argon. We can multiply that by the molar mass of argon, which is uh, 39.9, and get the mass of argon. And so I'm going to finish that off. 
Oh, no, can't be 30. All right. So there you go. All right, we'll go upstairs and do some more to get ready for Wednesday. Um, I have your one of your labs here. You can grab them.